I recall a few years ago a Jamaican friend of mine went to Israel. She was in an elevator. No blood clad Jews wanted to go in the elevator with her because she was what? Black. They looked at her with a scorn. You see me? Let me tell you a story that most of you guys don't know. In 1979, the great reggae superstar Peter Tosh cancelled four shows in Israel. You see me? It was alleged at the time that Israel were supplying the minority government, the minority white government, with arms to suppress the black people of South Africa. Here, so Peter Tosh said, I cannot be speaking about equal rights and justice in a country that is supplying arms to South Africa to suppress black people. No, I cannot do that. When they told Peter Tosh that he would lose $80,000, Peter said, fuck that. When it comes to my message, money is secondary. Peter Tosh would have been the first reggae artist to perform in Israel. So I do not condone the loss of life on any side. So I can't stand with anyone, okay? What I am standing with is that is none of my business. But if it was my business, then it would be toward the melanated dominant people that suffer racism on both sides. Did you know that the Israel was given Ethiopian women Depo Bavera shots? Cause they didn't want them coming into Israel and having children. They were sterilizing black women. Being black has raised global questions for so many years unanswered. The animosity being black has for so long endured, and the weight of cruelty and oppression shouldered for centuries by the state of being black is more than enough to ask the simple question, what is the original offense of being black? The unfortunate events which unfolded between Israel and Palestine these recent days has left the black communities living in them in great shock, utterly stranded and displaced on all sides, emotionally, physically, and on every grounds. Their trauma seemed to have heightened, and their persisting confusion worsened. In the middle of this whole pandemonium, the people of the black community are roped. They have neither sides to run to, hated by both, discriminated by both nations at war this day. They stand in the middle, praying and hoping for peace, for resolve into tranquility, for a place of a settled livelihood and existence where their opinions count and their colors are appreciated where their offsprings would grow with all the fondness and love in the world it takes to be alive. They are tired of the unending ugliness, the ceaseless brutalities, the day-to-day -day illogical suspicions and hostility, tired of the racism and denial seen in their children's faces on a daily basis. Welcome to yet another video segment. In this video, we are going to be examining the dark realities of being black in Israel. Before we continue, do not forget to support our efforts by hitting that like button before you. Share with your family and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening narrative, and kindly subscribe to keep the channel growing. Your support means a lot to us. In the heart of the Middle East, nestled amidst a landscape of ancient history and cultural vibrancy, lies Israel, a nation often celebrated for its technological prowess and diverse citizenry. Yet. Beneath the surface of this progressive facade lies a stark reality, the silent suffering of black Israelis. The black community in Israel, comprising approximately 2.5% of the population, traces its roots back to the 18th and 19th centuries when Jews of Ethiopian descent began immigrating to the region. Over the decades, they have faced a relentless barrage of discrimination, marginalization, and systemic exclusion a legacy that continues to cast a long shadow over their lives. The roots of this racial injustice can be traced back to the very foundation of the Israeli state, the Law of Return, 
which grants automatic citizenship to all Jews, has been interpreted to exclude Ethiopian Jews, relegating them to a status of second-class citizens. This legal distinction has set the stage for a cascade of discriminatory practices, from substandard housing and education to disproportionate rates of unemployment and incarceration. The everyday experiences of black Israelis are a testament to the pervasiveness of racism in their society. They face routine profiling by law enforcement, are subjected to verbal and physical abuse, and are often denied equal opportunities in employment and housing. The media, too, plays a complicit role, perpetuating negative stereotypes of black Israelis that further entrench their marginalization. Racism and racial discrimination against black people in Israel have been documented by various human rights organizations, including the United Nations Human Rights Committee, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch. In 2016, Amnesty International published a report titled Israel's Discriminatory Practices Against Ethiopian Jews. The report found that Ethiopian Jews face widespread discrimination in all aspects of their lives, from education and employment to housing and health care. The report also found that Ethiopian Jews are subjected to excessive force and violence by the police. In 2017, Human Rights Watch published a report titled Israel's Neglect of Ethiopian Jews. The report found that Ethiopian Jews are denied equal access to education, employment, and housing. The report also found that Ethiopian Jews are subjected to discrimination and abuse by government officials and members of the public. The hostilities and racial discrimination is not limited to black Israelis alone, but also to Afro-Palestinians living in the old city, Jerusalem. On a nearly hidden road, straddled between two police blockades, third-generation Afro-Palestinian teenagers tell Al Jazeera about the world they inherited, characterized by checkpoints, daily interrogations, night raids, and incessant fears of detention by Israeli forces. It's hard not to get detained here, 16-year-old Abdallah Balalawi, an Afro-Palestinian from Chad, told Al Jazeera from his home in the Old City. I have to be aware of the way I look and even the way I walk to avoid making the Israelis suspicious. Abdallah is one of at least 350 Afro-Palestinians from Nigeria, Chad, Senegal, and Sudan residing in the Muslim quarter of the Old City, adjacent to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. At just 17, Abdallah's cousin, Jibrin has already been detained five times by Israeli forces, mostly over allegations that he threw stones at Israeli police and military officers. While he and his friends face the same harassment as other Palestinians, he said they sometimes experience double racism for both being Palestinian and having dark skin. The soldiers are always cursing at me and interrogating me when I pass them. They try to provoke me so that I do something they could get me in trouble for, Jibrin told Al Jazeera noting that he has been beaten several times by Israeli police and soldiers during detentions. Most of those in my generation have the same experiences, he added with a shrug. It's routine. Growing up under the constant presence of Israeli soldiers, police and checkpoints, Jibrin's sister, Rua, only 18 years of age, told Al Jazeera that the militarization of the old city felt normal, but watching Jibrin leave home every day fills her with dread as Israeli forces constantly harass young Palestinian men, she said. The Israeli occupation has also ruptured Ali's family life. At the age of 16, his brother Mohammed was sentenced last year in an Israeli court to eight years in prison after authorities accused him of dropping a large rock on the head of an Israeli soldier, paralyzing him. Ali contends that his brother was innocent, claiming that Israeli forces used the allegations as an excuse to lock up Mohammed for his political activism. Ali and his siblings have not been allowed to visit their brother in prison because of what the Israelis have deemed security concerns, while the family's home has been repeatedly raided by Israeli forces. Mohammed Kuz, 17, recalls being late for school on a certain day and had rushed past an Israeli police who then stopped him and had begun searching his belongings. They found my house key and began interrogating me about what I was doing with it, saying that I could stab someone with it, he said, noting that the soldiers allowed him to pass only after he showed them his U.S. passport. Mohammed's sister, 14-year-old Shaden, said it was difficult to hold out much hope in the years ahead. Her brother, meanwhile, 
echoed the feeling of despair expressed by numerous youths in the black community. We've been resisting Israel since 1948 and nothing has changed, my shyness, Mohammed said. Non-violence hasn't worked. Violence hasn't worked. I really don't know what any of us should do anymore. The psychological impact of this relentless discrimination is profound. The blacks in Israel grapple with feelings of inferiority, alienation, and a constant sense of not belonging. Their children grow up internalizing the messages of societal exclusion, leading to self-doubt and a diminished sense of self-worth. Israeli society is not racially divided between blacks and whites in the way that American society has long been. Still, blackness in Israel has shaped the relations between Jews and Arabs, Ashkenazim and Mizrahim, Ethiopians and immigrant workers from Africa. Despite the salience of blackness in Israel, scholars of Israel and the wider academic field of Israel studies have largely ignored it so far. It may be said that the reason for this scholarly neglect is that in Israel, blackness does not neatly fit into the conventional configurations that exist in countries like the US and the UK. In its uniqueness, the Israeli case shows that blackness transgresses color lines in new and unexpected ways, offering fresh perspectives on Israeli society and challenging the arbitrary stipulations of blackness as a concept. While Israeli society is not racially divided between blacks and whites in the way that American society has long been, Israelis are certainly not colorblind, and having black skin can also have fatal consequences in Israel. For instance, in June 2019, Solomon Teka, an 18-year-old Israeli Jew of Ethiopian descent, was shot to death by an Israeli policeman, sparking widespread demonstrations and rioting. The Solomon Teka incident was not an unprecedented event. In April 2015, video footage of Israeli policemen brutalizing Damas Pakada, a Jewish Ethiopian soldier, moved thousands of Israelis, Ethiopians and others to the streets. One of the reasons this incident prompted a strong reaction was the fact that Pakada was an on-duty soldier wearing his military uniform. Military service is widely perceived as the ultimate rite of passage into Israeli society and as a stamp of approval for being a loyal Israeli citizen. Watching the footage of his assault, that was captured by a security camera, many Israelis saw Pakata not only as an individual, but as an example of the successful assimilation of Ethiopians in Israel. Yet, the incident revealed that despite this assimilation, Ethiopian Israelis still suffered from police brutality and discrimination, even when they are in uniform. Thus, in their protests, Israeli Ethiopians accused the police, and the Israeli establishment more broadly, of racism against their community due to their skin color. Notwithstanding the many schisms and tensions characterizing Israeli society, most Israelis still adhere, officially at least, to the idea of eliminating the differences between Jews in the country. Although the term black was used in Israeli discourse even before the establishment of the state, and was attributed to various groups, Israelis do not usually perceive themselves or groups in Israeli society in racial terms. Therefore, the Pakata incident, revealing this hidden racial aspect, gained widespread attention in Israel well beyond the Ethiopian community. This was not the first time, however, that blackness was associated with official racism and discrimination in Israel. In 1971, Second-generation Mizrahi immigrants living in the poor neighborhood of Musrara in Jerusalem formed the Israeli Black Panther movement. By identifying themselves as blacks, these Mizrahi youngsters alluded to the gap between the official Zionist narrative of ingathering the Jewish exiles and the reality in which some Jews remained outsiders in their home country. For the Israeli Black Panthers, blackness served mainly as a metaphor Whereas, for Ethiopian Israelis, blackness is the material fact of their skin color that makes them a target for institutional and systemic discrimination. Being African and black, Ethiopians seem to signify the far edge of Judaism and Zionism. The Ethiopian community, known as Beta Israel, was recognized as Jews by the chief rabbinate in Israel as early as 1973, a decision that qualified them for Aliyah, immigration to Israel. Yet, their Jewishness was often questioned. Many of them were required to go through a full Orthodox conversion. Children were placed in the religious education system, 
to make sure they received proper Jewish education, and the religious establishment did not acknowledge the authority of the community's spiritual leaders. In 1996, an Israeli journalist revealed that the Israeli medical establishment discarded all blood donations given by Ethiopian immigrants out of fear of HIV-AIDS contamination. In Israel, blood donation has symbolic aspects of brotherhood and contribution to the Israeli collective. Categorical rejection of all blood donations from an entire community, therefore, symbolized the exclusion of this community from the Jewish National Collective. The blood scandal was a defining moment for Ethiopian Israelis. Clarifying boundaries of belonging, it pushed many in the Ethiopian community to embrace racial self-identification and to affiliate themselves with a global black diaspora. They were inspired by African-American celebrities, especially famous rappers and athletes, who signified power and success. Many Ethiopians have also dedicated themselves to studying the history of the black power movement, as a source of inspiration for their own struggle and resistance. 14 months after being beaten by policemen, the newspapers reported that the Ethiopian soldier Damas Pakata became an officer in the Israeli army. Two years later, a popular news program on Israeli television featured a segment about the officer Pakata, titled The Victory of Damas, the battered soldier who became an outstanding officer. Made by the program's Ethiopian reporter Branu Tagin, the segment ended with an optimistic message of self-fulfillment, stating that, despite his difficult experience, Pakata emerged stronger, more connected to his roots, determined to continue to fight for his community and for himself. By embracing their blackness as a source of empowerment, third-generation Ethiopian, Israelis reassess their roots. Unlike the second generation, whose identification with African Americans aimed to bypass the backwardness attributed to their parents, Ethiopians today are more open to integrate their grandparents' cultural heritage as an asset rather than a burden. On 24th March 2018, people took part in a protest against the Israelis' plan to deport African migrants in Tel Aviv, Israel. Comments made by Israel's top political and religious leaders earlier in the month are a dismal reminder of how little black lives matter in the country and how African refugees remain in mortal danger. It was reported in Al Jazeera in that year thus. On March 17th, one of Israel's two chief rabbis, Yitzhak Yosef, called black people monkeys and the Hebrew equivalent of the N-word in his weekly sermon. It further stated that it is highly unlikely that Yosef will face any real repercussions for his racist comments as he was not demoted after saying in a similar sermon exactly two years ago that all non-Jews, Africans, Arabs or otherwise, could only live in Israel if they agree to serve the country's Jewish population. To be fair, racist comments from state-paid rabbis aren't exactly a rarity in Israel. Israel's other chief rabbi, Yisrael Lau, used the N-word to describe black athletes on his very first day in office on July 2013. But another anti-African comment made also early in the month of the same March 2018 by Israel's most powerful politician was almost certainly timed to coincide with the government's efforts to ethnically cleanse the country of the refugees. On March 19th, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said in a public speech that the arrival of non-Jewish African refugees was much worse for Israel than severe attacks by Sinai terrorists. Netanyahu's comments come as citizens across the country have been publicly expressing reservations to his expulsion plan. Since the start of the calendar year, Israelis from all walks of life have registered their adamant opposition to the planned deportations that was scheduled to begin on April 1st. In the same vein, the killing of a black Jew sparked another violent protest in Israel in July 2019. It was reported thus, the violent protests that shook Israel on July the 2nd had all the hallmarks of race riots. A young black man had been shot dead by an off-duty policeman in unclear circumstances. Thousands of Ethiopian Jews took to the streets, throwing stones at police officers, blocking roads, and overturning police cars. Their claims of systematic racism and police brutality were met, on the whole, with condescending denial. Politicians chided them for the violence while issuing vague expressions of sympathy few bluntly mentioned the word racism. 
media outlets and pundits supporting the government aired conspiracy theories suggesting that left-wing organizations had incited the violence. In recent times, there have been violent clashes in Tel Aviv involving Eritrean asylum seekers and ensuing calls to deport all migrants, which have put the spotlight on Israel's widespread and long-standing police brutality and racism against African migrants. In the wake of violent clashes during protests by rival groups of Eritreans in South Tel Aviv at the beginning of September 2023, the Israeli government launched a full-scale offensive against African migrants. The unrest erupted after opponents of the Eritrean government asked Israeli authorities to cancel an embassy event and clashed with government supporters. The involvement of the Israeli police dramatically intensified the street fight as officers fired on protesters with live ammunition, arguably a disproportionate response. In the aftermath of the altercations between pro- and anti-regime Eritreans, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to deport the illegal infiltrators involved in the skirmishes. More than 50 Eritrean protest participants were detained without charge or trial. Just a week later, the Israeli cabinet approved $5 million to incentivize African migrants and refugees to depart, the latest of several measures the Israeli regime has taken over the years to try to kick asylum seekers out of the country. It also announced plans to strengthen the police presence in South Tel Aviv, where many migrants live. Halifom Sultan, an Eritrean asylum seeker and activist living in Tel Aviv, thinks police violence in the events at the Eritrean embassy reflects the Israeli government's policies, observing a recurring use of excessive force on non-Jews in the country. Every time there's an incident of violence, police forces will turn against us, refugees. He told the New Arab, the refugee activist hinted that it is possible that Israeli officials purposefully left these politically opposed Eritrean groups to clash with each other to fuel the perception that asylum seekers are criminals, he says. The Israeli Prime Minister reported that there remains a problem in South Tel Aviv and elsewhere that needs to be resolved and ordered a plan to remove all of the country's African migrants, claiming that they are a threat to the future of Israel as a Jewish and a democratic state. Between the years of 2005 and 2012, Israel began implementing several policies to dissuade immigration, as many Africans arrived in the country via Egypt, before building a fence along the desert border which largely stemmed the numbers of incoming migrants. Sigal Rosen, public policy coordinator at the Israeli Rights Group, Hotline for Refugees and Migrants, HRM, commented speaking to the New Arab. Thus, the Israeli government has initiated so many directives to make African migrants' life miserable in order to coerce them into leaving. Blackness in Israel reveals that blackness exceeds visible differences between social, ethnic, or racial categories. It is even more than an analytic device, a metaphor if you will, that helps us think of and represent social inequalities. In Israel, it is not always easy to tell a Jew from a Palestinian, an Ashkenazi from Mizrahi, or an Ethiopian Jew from an Eritrean refugee just by their appearance. Yet, they all engage in practices of blackness. The Israeli case shows that blackness, unlike how it is often discussed, transgresses color lines and is open for novel reconstructions. New and unexpected configurations of blackness offer fresh perspectives on Israeli society and challenge the arbitrary stipulations of blackness as a concept. In conclusion, the sufferings of being black in Israel are not abstract concepts but concrete experiences etched into the lives of individuals. The path towards true equality for the black community in Israel is a long and arduous one. It requires a concerted effort from society at large, a willingness to confront and dismantle the deep-rooted prejudices that have plagued Israel for decades. Only when blacks in Israel are accorded the full rights and dignity they deserve can Israel truly claim to be a just and equitable society. Through genuine dialogue, understanding, and action, can Israel truly embrace its diversity and create a society where all citizens feel valued and respected. This brings us to the end of this video segment. Do share with you what you think in the comment section below, we appreciate always hearing your thoughts. Do also encourage our efforts by hitting the like button, share with family and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and subscribe to keep the channel growing if you are yet to. Thank you for watching.